Yeah, I've been buying Christmas presents for like two months already. I f***ing love Christmas. I sing Christmas carols. God rest ye merry. I love lives. What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Thursday, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask TNH Live. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and today uh, I'm going to be answering questions live on Instagram. So let's do it. Uh, all right, before we jump in, a quick wristwatch check. I am wearing an absolutely wonderful, uh, Jesus, f this thing is mint. Um, a vintage Rolex Datejust, reference 1601, uh, with an immaculate champagne dial, very sharp uh, yellow gold oyster case, and full tritium plots. Yep, 11 tritium all, all the way around. Great watch. Love it. It's available in the watch shop at theowenharris.com, um, along with, I don't know, 25 other, like, stupid good vintage watches. So, check them out. So, let's take a look at some of these questions. Um... You hate Seiko, but what do you think of Creedor? I don't hate Seiko. If you look at last week's content in its totality, you will know very clearly that I respect Seiko. I think that Seiko has earned much more than they have gotten on the public respect end. Um, I think that it's their marketing that is some of their biggest problem, right? Very, very, you know, very clear. Um, Creedor proves my point. Credor is an incredible manufacturer, and I can't tell you I can't tell you why because I've only consumed content on Credor and never educated on Credor, so I can't sit here and be didactic about Seiko's you know prize gem of a brand, right? Um, but what I do understand is that Credor is traditional, traditional Japanese watchmaking, um, hand watchmaking at its highest form, right? So. Um, the fact that it's under the name Credor and always has been, as opposed to Seiko, proves my point that Seiko has a brand problem. If Seiko was an asset to a top, top, top tier luxury brand, it would be called Seiko, not Credor. Point proven. We walk away. Next f***ing conversation, because I'm done talking about Seiko. I'll talk about them again next week. 1803 or 18038, I know you wrote about it a few months back, but really? Um, great question, and I don't have an answer necessarily. They are very similar watches, almost identical, but they are very different. And their difference has nothing to do, in my opinion, with their quick set functions. Okay, which, although is their technical biggest, you know, difference. I think that the 18038 is a modern watch. Of course, it's not. It was introduced, I think, in the early 80s or late, late 70s, somewhere around there. Um, so, so it is vintage. By definition, it is vintage. But if you look at all of its elements, from its sapphire crystal to its updated bracelet, which is much more tight than an 1803 um, and much more resilient to stretch, um, everything about the watch seems to be more modern and more similar to a modern day date that you would buy in the store, right? That's not a bad thing. That can be a really good thing. I happen to love the feeling of a, of, of a vintage 18038 um, um, presidential bracelet. I think it's super comfortable. I don't sweat with it. Um, it's stretchy, sure, but it's a vintage watch. And that's, you know, I started a vintage watch shop. I think that my love for vintage watches in their oldness is pretty clear, you know? So, you know, I won't take one over the other necessarily, but if I had to, 1803. I think. What is a vintage watch that people love but you hate? I'm gonna think about your question, but I'm gonna answer that. Um, I'm gonna answer my question in the interim. What's a vintage watch that I loved, other people hate? Right. I am asked constantly about my opinion on Cartier. Right. I am a big, big, big Cartier fan. Unapologetically, they get a lot of shit for a lot of things they've done, um, and I'm a big, big fan. Okay. I don't care what movements in a Cartier. From an investment perspective, there is a difference, of course. If a vintage tank is powered by, uh, I don't know, a, a PSA movement, or well, I don't know who made, I don't remember who made the movements for, for the vintage tanks, um, a Jeje Le Coultre movement, for, for instance, which they did, um, then that is worth more money than if it was powered by a quartz movement. I recognize that. I am acute. I, I trade watches for a living. I know, I, I know that. Um, but for my own personal use, I don't care. I think that the benefit here is, uh, or, or, or the reason you buy Cartier is not for these movements. For me, right, for me, and you collectors out there that are super into all the nuances and paying four times for something that I get the same enjoyment out of at, at a quarter of the price, that's fine. I'm not judging you, right? But for me, a Cartier is all about the design, right? A Cartier is all about the Roman numerals, right? A Cartier is all about those fine sword hands. And, and the, the definition of those precious metal cases, right? A Cartier, to me, 
um, evokes, hold on, this fuck Cartier to me evokes this, um, I guess pa I, I'm passionate because it evokes this um, love and more so respect for a brand that has proven over the course of the last 130 years uh, that they have unwavering, almost unwavering, dedication to these core principles of design, which is, I say it the same way every time. Right, the fact that they've reimagined, you know, their simple precious metal case uh, Roman dial between the uh, between their horseshoe and their uh, their tank Luis and their Santos and their you know Galbli or their Sintre and their American is incredible to me. Um, I need I, I don't need to go much further. The movements don't mean anything. They mean something when I'm when I'm paying a premium. Of course, I I, I won't pay a premium or a stupid number um, if it's unwarranted. Um, but for me, if I have my druthers, put a quartz movement and give it to me because it's it's the case and the design that just it speaks to me so okay um you kiss your mother with that mouth um on the cheek yeah my mom has a worse mouth than i do it's please she's italian do i like vacheron constantin great question answer is yes um the quality of vacheron constantin watches is you know just the same same on par with patek philippe in so many instances um sure uh, the patek definitely does go um, above and beyond to my understanding in their ultra high complications or at least they do so and they do so successfully you know um, if you look at the, the paddock uh, what do they call them the grand complications uh, they at least get more attention than the Vacheron do um, and not just by the media but but by Vacheron themselves uh, a paddock rests on those you know, ultra, ultra, you know, luxury, um, and I don't, when I say luxury, I don't just mean expensive, ultra, ultra, you know, complicated watches, whereas Vacheron does produce them, but I don't think that that's what, you know, their, their thing is, you know, to me, Vacheron is incredibly valuable in that 20 to, I guess, what, $70,000 range from their overseas up to their Corn de Vache chronographs, um, they are incredible watches, I, am probably more drawn to a Vacheron um, in that range, at twenty to twenty to you know seventy thousand dollars, than I am to a Patek. I think that, um, and not dissing Patek owners, Patek owners, you know, it's, I don't mean anything by it. Um, but if if you spent all that money and you did so on a Vacheron, to me, the odds of you being interested in the watch itself more are higher, right? If you bought the Patek, you may have done it because you just like the brand. Nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm a, I am I'm love brands. I love the idea of brand identity. So I'm not judging you at all. And if I did, I'd be judging myself. Um, but there is something to be said about a watch geek or a geek of any kind that has truly little maybe loyalty to a brand itself and just to watches, right? Because a Patek Philippe uh, 5170 is a more prestigious watch than the Vacheron Constantin Corn de Vache, right? Round about the same price, you know, but the Vacheron guy chose the watch with less notoriety. Um, so I'm I'm kind of enchanted, or at least interested, in that idea of the Vacheron culture. A little bit more specifically about the watches themselves, I happen to think that the Overseas um, is a tremendously undervalued watch, a watch that loses a ton of money on the secondhand market, uh, and a watch that you can scoop up for very cheap, comparably. Um, in contrast to Patek and the Nautilus. It's a no-brainer. You can get a Vacheron overseas between you know twelve and twenty thousand uh, dollars, depending on how you know crazy you want to go, and get an incredibly well-made watch. Whereas the fifty-seven eleven Nautilus, you're paying upwards of forty thousand and getting you know the same the same watch. All right, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of Ask TNH Live. Uh, don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed my watch geeky ranting, uh, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Theo and Harris. I'll see you all tomorrow.